Life does not need to be hard. No river is straight all the way. Beatrice Lafon is a top retail troubleshooter, having been CEO of Claire's Accessories, Energy of Superdry, a board member of Pizza Express, and many, many more. She's here to tell you about life and sacrifices of a successful CEO and how to become one. When we are younger, we are trained to take obstacles head on. I was working 14, 15 hours every single day, every weekend. I had not been there for my family family ever. What's the hardest thing about working with private equity? There is no room for failure. You have to be at your base all of the time. Being off sick? No. Going on holiday? No. <laughs> you know, you work, work, work. Before success, there's failure. Success is just uh, the ability to get up one more time. Do you feel like you have sacrificed your personal life to be a CEO? Beatrice. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Maria. Lovely to see you. I've been very much looking forward to meeting you. I mean, your list of accomplishments is, is incredible. I mean, you were the CEO of Claire's Accessories, the Pinky, um, TM Lewin is on the list as well. As a chair. As a chair, yeah. lots and lots of positions and non-executive director. Um, well, for those people who don't know you, can you give us a very quick background as to who you are? Okay, thank you, <laughs> Maria. So I'm Beatrice. I always introduce myself as a retailer. I've been in retail for about well, over 40 years now, dare I say. I'm French of origin, as you probably gather from, uh, from my accent. I'm a single mom with a son of uh, age 16. Uh, going on 25, I always say, very mature. <laughs> Telling me what to do and not to do already. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, from a business point of view, yes, I've worked mostly in the UK, but also uh, across Europe and, uh, and in the USA. I worked in the, an executive capacity uh, until 2016, and then the last six, seven years as a non-exec director or chair, both here in the UK and, uh, and in Europe. Always, I've always had an international career, and that's quite important to me. I love the diversity that, uh, that it brings. Mm. Uh, but my original background is buying and merchandising. So I'm a, a product person and a numbers person at the same time. I saw that. So it's M&S, River Island, and I think I'm missing Dorothy Perkins. Yes. That right. Very yes. good. <laughs> yeah. Those, especially, you know, back in the day, I mean, these were the grounds where they trained real kind of traders you know, that merchandises, you know, the, the people who sit between the numbers and the product. So real kind of like schools of learning how to be a retailer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that takes me back uh, quite a few years. I joined Marks & Spencer in 1982. That's after I graduated uh, from my business degrees. And uh, I was one of the first women that the company employed, in fact, as a merchandiser. There were only four of us uh, at the time. We were an experiment. You know, could women do the job? And could a foreigner do the job? Me being the only foreigner in our little group <laughs> at the time, it was quite funny. But I adored that role right from the beginning. So I joined MNS in 82, went on to the normal uh, training, you know, in, uh, in the stores, working in the stores to really understand the cold face of, uh, of the operations. And then a year later, moved into, uh, into head office. How did you feel about being in the experiment? Well, um, I'm not sure I felt anything about it. I thought it was quite odd and quite funny, but you know, being still a foreigner and quite young, I had only been in the UK at that point uh, a couple of years. You know, I, uh, I thought the British were just odd. <laughs> <laughs> and why not? Uh, you know, I was delighted they gave me the opportunity and I made the, you know, the best of it, I think. Mm. One of the things, one of the studies recently I have come across was by, I think it's Terence. Fitzsimmons talking about uh, looking and investigating into the different paths of to CEO and looking at the kind of like the gender disparity as to why there's so few female CEOs out there. And one of the interesting things that he has found was that the male CEOs predominantly came from, you know, very stable homes where their mothers were, um, where their mothers stayed at home. And female CEOs came from a background of either where their mothers were either entrepreneurs or they worked or from some kind of trauma. So illness, death, separation. Um, what was your experience like, the early experience, your childhood? Well, I'm not sure I feed the mold. <laughs> I'm not aware of that research. That's quite interesting, actually. Mm -hmm. 
uh, my background, my father was a, an engineer, but in research, you know, and uh, he worked on Concorde for most of his career. So we had uh, models of Concorde, you know, everywhere uh, in the house. So math, math and research and analysis was a big part of my upbringing through my dad. And my mom had inherited her mother's shop, a toy shop there, I say, in the suburbs of Paris. And that was my first introduction into retail, in fact. And uh, mm. already as a little girl, you know, I enjoyed uh, you know, serving customers uh, and getting the product ranges together, deciding on the pricing. I used to go on the sourcing trips with my mother. It was really great fun. So I guess she was a working woman uh, with the shop. She was also a judge in France, you know, in what we call the Les Prudhommes, which is kind of a... Yeah, a lower lower courts, you know, in a, in a, in the region, uh, and she also sits at the at the, on, at the chamber of commerce. So I guess that was my role model. I guess, mm -hmm. but my grandmother also had work because well, she ran the shop before that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think everyone in my life, whether you were a man or a woman, worked. So there was no other model really, mm -hmm. but to do more of the same. Who did you look up to then? You mean between my parents or um, just in general? I mean, you're talking about not having you know that many role models, but who who did you look up to when you were growing up? I didn't have role models, I think, when I was younger. I just had a, a strong desire mm -hmm. to do what I could with whatever talents I had been given or opportunities that were there. You know, I'm a sportswoman at heart and played a lot of sport when I was younger. I still do, in fact, now, although I'm not so young. And uh, that need to compete, that need to win, that joy of working as a team, of preparing, of, you know... Uh, the value of having a coach and a mentor, all these kind of things. I learned really from sport rather than from business. And it just carried on with me uh, when I then, you know, ended up in a, you know, in a business career. Mm. Which sport was that? Horse riding was my big, big sport. <laughs> ah, I used to compete, I used to do three-day yeah. hunting. Uh, and in fact, at age 16, mm. I was offered a contract to ride for the French team wow. on a professional level. But uh, my parents said, uh, no, no, school. <laughs> <laughs> no change of career. So, but, you know, it's quite funny because to this day, occasionally I just think back and I say, oh, I wonder what we'd be doing today, you know, had I gone the other way. So, yeah, horse riding was my big, uh, big, big sport. Basketball was the other big sport. And we, you know, we used to play in the French League. And in fact, I won the championship a couple of years, which was great. Amazing. Uh, and I used to do ballet dancing as well, which was kind of different. Mm -hmm. But I like the combination of the uh, artistic side and the physical side mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, classical dancing. My mom was a ballet dancer. Oh, yeah. beautiful. So I remember growing up, you know, going into the theatre and feeling very inspired by music and dancing and just the movement of it I think you know when I look back into my own life and think about oh what could have been I wanted to be a ballet dancer but my mom was like absolutely not like this is this is such a hard career yeah. so yeah that didn't yeah but after sport you know I, I I wanted to be an architect that was kind of my next dream and when I was a little girl and after that I wanted to be a lawyer and couldn't understand why the law was not black and white you know in my young mind if it's the law, that's the right answer, or that's the wrong answer. But learning that there was a lot of grey, I found that quite difficult because I am quite black and white, naturally. Right. <laughs> mm. uh, and then, yes, then business became kind of the last choice, but uh, a good choice. I've always felt very content with, uh, with my choice. How did you end up going down the business route, or what was the pivotal moment for you deciding this is going to be the path? Well, <laughs> it's going to sound really funny, but I guess that's what life brings. Um, and that's probably new for the public domain, but uh, my mother was having an affair with someone, a businessman, who was where one of the best business school was in France. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day, that's what he recommended to me. He said, why don't you apply to that school? That, you know, it sounds like to me, you would enjoy business. And I applied and I got accepted and the rest is history. Wow, what a story. <laughs> <laughs> it's like these sort of serendipitous things that happened in your life or someone saying something that you may not have thought of, you know, can like change the course of your life. Yeah, and of course, my mother, she was very supportive because it meant she now had an alibi to come and visit him. <laughs> <laughs> so you were complicit in the affair. <laughs> oh, so funny. But look, it worked. So that was good. Mm. What 
was your most favorite role that you've had? Oh gosh, that's a difficult one. Difficult to choose because, you know, I have worked now in my executive career for about, I think it was 19 different companies. And there's only two where I think I made the wrong choice in terms of, you know, the company environment. The chemistry was not there for me, which would mean there are four. <laughs> 17 companies or role for me were great. Um, I think if I think back, the one that gave me the most joy pretty much every day actually was a long time ago when I was a merchandiser at Marks and Spencer. We, uh, and I say we because, you know, you, you never do anything on your own. My partner in crime, a lady called Peggy, Peggy Young, was a senior selector for Babywear. And I was appointed as the, uh, the senior merchandiser for Babywear, T77, still remember that. <laughs> and that department was only a few years old as far as Marks and Spencer was concerned. I can't remember now how old, but young in terms of Marks and Spencer. And at that point, we sold everything, you know, hardware, clothing, of course, nappies, little accessories, etc. And that department, which would have been maybe eight years old or something like that, have never made any money. And at that point, I had been at MNS already five or six years. And my bosses had identified my ability, you know, to see where the problems were and uh, develop the right solutions to fix things. So when I was appointed to uh, Babyware, that was kind of the thing. You say, okay, you know, you've got six months to tell us what's wrong and what we need to do to fix Babyware. If you can't find a solution, we'll shut down that department. No pressure. No pressure. Well, I didn't see that pressure. I saw it as a challenge, you know. And then we worked as a team and then we found out that, yes, there was absolutely a way through. We eliminated everything except clothing and then made the incredible discovery that actually babies sleep more most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't do sleepwear as part of our clothing offer. You know, some very obvious things like that. But what I can say is that within 18 months, we not only recovered performance of baby wear, you know, as a team, but uh, we became the most profitable department in the whole of Marks and Spencer that year. Mm. So that was great. And then I haven't really not, never looked back. And what I liked about it, really to answer your question slightly differently, was the level of freedom that we, we as a team were afforded by, you know, the MNS structure, which I know often is seen as quite uh, invasive, but we did not have that experience then. We had a lot of trust with all our various uh, directors and in fact, a lot of support. Although I did, yeah, I was told off by my boss after we performed the way we performed, saying, how come you managed to grow the business so fast? when the contracts we've signed would only allow you to do a 5% gross year on year. And I just went. And that's because our suppliers basically had trust in what we were doing and would back our judgment even with our contracts because they knew we were right. Mm -hmm. So when I needed the call to call the stock, the stock was there because they had decided to commit. But m and had not made the commitment. What was the secret so. to your success then? Um... Well, I won't call it my success, right? Because I, I can't remember now, but, the, you know, a buying department in those days at m and might have been 20, 30 people. You know, it's a big team. I had a great team of selectors. We work very well together. We have a very good eye for product. Um, great team of distributors, allocators, technologists. You know, in those days, each department would have its own fabric and garment technologist. I know <laughs> days have changed now. So we were really a, an ecosystem and all the resources that you needed was there with you in that buying department. As I said, very supportive uh, bosses uh, up to a level uh, and then a great supply base. We, you know, we had narrowed the supply base to just a, a dozen or so. Um, and yeah, total osmosis. It was, you know, great communication, great camaraderie, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so a clear view as to what we wanted to do, a shared vision, and the resources to make it happen. And we had pace, we had drive. I mean, you know, we were young and very excited to, uh, to do a good job. Mm. Talk to me about your first CEO role. Where was that? Which one was my first CEO role? Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think my first title as MD, mm. and if you would call that CEO, was Ice Storm, which was a um, a contemporary art company. We used to have different parts of the business. We had an agency, re you know, representing some of the best contemporary artists in the world. 
you know, like Damien Hurst, which you probably everyone's heard of. And then we had, call it a retail division, which is the bit I was be appointed as MD, where we made limited editions from the work of the artists we represented, which we sold through galleries, which we had across the world and online. Um, so that was my first appointment, having been in the corporate world all my life, <laughs> uh, having met the private equity world through my role as a director of home base where we were selling the business at the time. It was owned by Sainsbury uh, at the time, we got bought by uh, Schroeder's Ventures or Pumira, are they called now, and through that exercise then got to meet private equity. And at one point, one of them gave me a call and said, we have a problem with this little business here. A lot of investors and no one can agree on the future. Can you come and help us sort it out? And that's what I did. So that's my, what was my first rule. And so different from anything I had done. One, because of the environment, private equity, as I'm sure you know, and your listeners would know is a quite a different way of working from the, the, the corporate world. Mm -hmm. A tiny business compared to what I had been running before, even as a buying department, you know, in a large company. Um, How did you find that going from, you know, working with very big business and then having a, a different problem to solve? The biggest difference would be the size of the team would be much smaller. So everyone had to, I won't say work harder because it's only 24 hours in the day, but smarter. So it helps. It forces you to prioritize a lot more, to be very sharp about the decisions you make and to seek results really quickly so that you can get more momentum and then move faster and therefore get onto the next thing. Mm -hmm. So the smaller of the team made a different style of management, but also meant each of us had to do a lot more. You know, you had no one else really to delegate to. So many long hours. I mean, that's much more than uh, anything I had experienced in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big adjustment too, because you're having to take on more uncertainty with more responsibility and less resources and that's that's a lot yeah but the scope is uh, looser i'm going to say you know in the corporate world there are always i'm going to call them rules policies you know ways of doing restrictions things, which you know people might call restriction mm -hmm. in the private equity world we agree on the objective and the time frame and the way you get there is really up to you and the team so intellectually, there's a lot more freedom. You're not going to do anything illegal, of course. I'm not talking about that. But, you know, the avenues you might want to choose, what you might want to test, the partnership you might want to create, you have a lot more freedom in making those calls rather than having to fit in within a, in a particular framework. Yeah. I mean, at m and I mean, and I'm sure it's changed a lot now, but in the old days, it was very hard to bring in a new supplier on board, if not impossible. And also very hard if you decide you don't want to work with that supplier anymore because of performance or whatever it might be. Because invariably, when you make those decisions at your level for commercial reasons, at some point, other conversation would be happening up the line. And then it would come back to you and say, no choice, you have to work on those mm -hmm. And I have said that you're going to place at least this volume from these guys. So that, you know. You don't have that in a private equity world. You really are there to make the right choice for the business always in that little world. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, the diktat from MS would not be right. Mm -hmm. But in the little world that you know, it, it doesn't always make sense because you're not aware of the bigger picture. What's the hardest thing about working with private equity? There is no room for failure. I think that's the biggest difference between the corporate world and private equity. You know, you have to be at your base all of the time. Being off sick? No. Going on holiday? No. <laughs> you know, you work, work, work. They want their powder flesh because you want the results. But that works for me because, you know, I'm totally result orientated. I've got very high achievement drive still to this day. And I will take whatever it takes to get to the results that we all want. Mm. Um, in corporate life, and again, it may have changed now. You know, I haven't been in the corporate world for nearly 20 years now, but... Um, you know, in the days I was there, you could go home at six o'clock and sleep at night. You know, you could leave the work behind. You could go on holiday, you could have a weekend and not think about work. In my world, in, private, uh, in the private world, that I've never enjoyed that. 
if I remember years ago, I used to work for, um, that was a private owner, so not PE, but you know, family. <laughs> and the, 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 the head of the family was based in Canada and the business was based here in the UK. And every day, every day, seven days a week, midnight, he wanted a call to know how the business had been that day. And I tried to explain that actually something, there is not something important to report to an owner every day, let alone when it's midnight my time every day. How did you say that? How did you approach that? Well, gently, but what I can say is a few months later, I had joined as an interim to do that role to help him do a, a recovery. <clears throat> When uh, six months in, he asked me if I wanted to, uh, that he wanted to appoint me as a CEO in the business on a permanent basis. I just said, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, because at the end of the day, you have to make the choices. And, and although I'm very happy to support and make trade-offs, because that's what life is about, it comes a point, uh, too much is too much. Mm. And I made a call then that that was not right for me. And I didn't even have, a, you know, any children then, but that was too much. Mm. That was too much. But conversely, that great communication and, you know, ongoing communication meant that if I had important decisions that I needed answers or support with, I knew that every day I was talking with him, I could talk about something. And indeed, in the case of that particular business, you know, we needed at one point to open a, a new warehouse. And uh, I just mentioned it once. The second day, I gave him more information. The third day, I actually gave him the paper to reflect on. The fourth day, I got the answer, yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, even in private equity environment, I've never had such a quick answer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like anything. You take the rough with the smooth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that bit was a bit too much. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had a little bit of that when I was at Claire's as well. I had uh, very demanding uh, owners. And uh, it was not midnight because they were in California and we were in Chicago, so we're not so far from each other. But still, they had a, a big, big uh, need, I'm going to call it, to be in touch with the business uh, pretty much every single day. What do you feel most proud of in that role? At Claire's? So. Yes. Oh, I love the team that we built. It was such a joy. In fact, you might know Claire, the Claire's uh, corporate color is purple. And uh, we used to say that, uh, you know, we were so... Um, yeah, in love with the business, with the brand, with the teams that we have built all over the world. We used to say that purple is running through our, you know, if you cut us open, <laughs> our blood is purple. Bleed purple. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were, um, yeah, an incredible team. And I remember when I started, my first role there was to run the European business as the, the president for Europe. And when I set up the, uh, the first meeting for all of the senior leaders to get together, um, I found out that they did not know each other. Some had been in the business, you know, 10, 15 years. They had never met their colleagues, different country. And we didn't have a common language. Not everybody spoke English, for instance, or French or Italian or whatever. So our very first meeting was very interesting because you had, you know, 40 odd people who could not even communicate and didn't know each other. <laughs> but it is great. I mean, it, it built fantastic relationship and, uh, you know, Great thank you to all my colleagues who didn't speak English and chose to learn English so we, as a team, we could operate. Mm -hmm. So I love that team very much. And when, uh, when we all left, um, so that's after I was then the CEO of the group, you know, I was in the business five years in the end. Um, it's a large company. I mean, at the time, we had 3,500 stores in 49 countries. We had over 1,000 concessions, about 500 franchise stores. And uh, after five years, or even before the five years, but about three years, we could change anything in any part of our business, and I include all of our stores, within 48 hours. The business had become so nimble. So that I'm really proud of. Because that's where, you know, life in retail has changed a great deal. You know, what that used to be a merchandise at Marks & Spencer over 40 years ago, we used to do our plans three years out. I remember I was in men's knitwear for part of my uh, time with m and We used to buy our cashmere three years out, you know, in terms of you know, the wool. Um, now, very, very difficult to plan three years out. You don't even know what's going to happen next week. Mm -hmm. So your ability to respond and be reactive, see the trend, see when it's actually the beginning of a trend and act to respond 
is much more important today than it used to be. In the old days, your ability to plan was your, was the key strength. Do you think it's harder being a CEO now of a retail business than it was before? I think it's always been hard, really. Even if I think back you know, before my career in the old days, challenges are very different. Of course, you always think that it's worse now, <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't think so. I think it's just different. Uh, I think what is hard now is the fact that you don't really know what tomorrow will bring. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more uncertainty than we had then. But conversely, that you have a lot more at your disposal than you had then. You know, when I started as a merchandiser, I mean, we didn't even have calculators, let alone computers, right? We didn't have mobile phones. So mm -hmm. you forget all of that, but we did everything with pen and paper. Mm -hmm. If I remember, you were asking me about Claire's earlier on, we... Uh, when I was in Chicago then, we had, um, we had a power cut at one point. And so, of course, everything goes down, all the systems go down. And we're not quite sure how long the power cut is going to be for. So we wait, and two hours later, we get notice from the authorities. Actually, it's more serious than they thought. You know, it's going to go on for a bit longer. So another two hours pass, and then my team said, well, shall we send stuff home? Because it's now halfway through the day. You know, we're not really going to do anything. And we still don't know when the power will come back. And I'm thinking, you know, we had about, I don't know, 700 people in head office in, in Chicago. I said, I'm not sending 700 people home. <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyway, and I said, uh, oh, yes. And it was also a time we're doing our, our um, what we call our buying trip and placing our orders and deciding on the quantities we had to buy based on, you know, the distribution we wanted for the SQ, et cetera. And one of my teams say, and really because we can't do our work, but the computers are down, you know, we can't actually run all the POs and all the modeling, etc. And I went, what do you mean? They don't know how to do that without a computer? And suddenly it dawned on me that, you know, pretty much all the people that we employ then, that's when you can see my age, <laughs> had always worked with a computer mm -hmm. and therefore had no idea how you decide an allocation, how you decide the right quantity to buy, which the world I come from, I mean, it's as easy as long plus one equals two, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, we're going to do a workshop this afternoon and see how to be a merchandiser with pen and paper. Mm -hmm. And there was enough old ones <laughs> like me in the business to actually do that. And it was great fun. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our younger team member on the buying floor with about... Um, I can't remember how many people we had, but we had over 100 people at Claire's on, on the buying floor. And of course, we had Icing, which was our other, you know, other brand also with our own buying team. Just could not believe that the job they did every day could be done without a computer, mm -hmm. let alone without a calculator. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of fun. But it was great because it gave people that critical thinking that I think sometimes is missing of younger people because you assume that what the computer tells you is right. But sometimes it's not right. And yes, it might be that the input you is not right or elements have changed and the software is old by now and it's not taking into account all the things that it needs to take into account. And what comes out of the sausage machine is not the best answer. But if you don't know, and I understand if you've never done it another way, how can you actually make that judgment call that that answer doesn't look right? Mm. So it was fun and I think hopefully we gained a a skill or two <laughs> yeah <laughs> by doing it you're talking about that and i i remember when i was, was my grandma was the one who, who who raised me from you know probably the ages of like five to about nine and from what i understand her job was being i think she did payroll or like some form of like hr accounting for the factory that she used to work for so she would calculate everybody's salaries and i remember the what is it called is it called an abacus abacus yeah uh, with the with yeah. the little things, and I remember that's how I learned how to count. So she would teach me that. And there is something about being certain in your own ability to work things out with whatever the tools you've got. Um, that does put you. It gives you that sense of I don't know control or feeling that you are more capable as opposed to relying on you know like that kind of quick calculation. So I can see how how it must have completely confuddled the team, <laughs> but at the same time, actually learning that skill and being able to go to the foundation and build on the basics could feel very empowering. 
Yeah, yeah, but I remember, I mean, that's a, a French thing, but I'm, I, you know, it might be the same here. I remember a few years ago reading that the French government had done this survey and then they worked there about the children in school because they wanted to update the curriculum, which here we do every year. Mm -hmm. In France, it's not done every year, but, you know, it's still reviewed from time to time. And there were two incredible insights that came from that survey. One was that young people did not know how to read a map because they had always used, you know, SatNav or GPS, as we would say in Europe. Uh, and they had not realized that the food they buy in a supermarket, like beef as an example, actually comes from a cow. Which, you know, sounds incredible. I remember the readings, they said, what? Where do they think it comes from? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, there was a program then for many years, I don't know if they still do it now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about the map, but certainly about the meat to actually, you know, as part of, you know, teaching younger children to actually help them make the link between the cow and then, you know, the, the, the meat already cut. And you know, the French take their food, you know, very seriously. Mm -hmm. So if a French child or a child brought up, you know, through the French schooling system would not know about the origin of food, that would be really bad. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but you know, you forget because you take it for granted. But conversely, you know, I see with my son, he knows things. I, have, I don't even have a clue about what he's talking about. You know, his great passion is AI and hacking and cybersecurity. Ethical hacking, sorry, I have to say. And, uh, and you know, he uses words. I haven't got a clue what those words are. I've never heard them before. So, you know, but at the same time, there's plenty of things that we take for granted and I know he doesn't really know. Mm. So uh, that's the joy, I think, of progress. I don't know if we call it progress. <laughs> As you said, it's, it's different because you gain something, but you also lose something when you have new ways of doing things you know on the one hand you have your you know computer that can do your calculations uh you can do things much faster than you were able to do before so instead of you know having your supplies that's going to take you you know three months to deliver something you know you're now working with i don't know eight weeks or whatever it is um and the same with generations where you know you even though they take things for granted, they have the knowledge that, you know, you you, you can't have because they're just con consistently exposed to it and, you know, consuming information in a completely different way to how we used to. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, you were talking about your grandma earlier on. You know, my own mother does not understand why her grandson, so my son, uh, needs a calculator to calculate anything. She can do, still now, age 90, everything in her head. Wow. And so quickly, it's very impressive. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother was the same. Uh, but conversely, you know, the kind of mathematics that my son can do age 16, she or I had not even learned age 16. So, you know, it changes. That's not when you ask me about the CEO challenge, you know, I, in a way, they're not comparable. You know, there are different challenges with the times. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say the job is any easier. It's different for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important quality, therefore, of any CEO or any leader is the ability to continue to learn, you know, always. 100%. You know, I mean, you know, in our world in retail, of course, pricing is a, is a key thing. Mm -hmm. And again, in the old days, you know, we did pricing based on very simple math. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in fact, Marks and Spencer were very simple. It was, what's the cost price? That was the official margin that MLS wanted to work with very low compared to today's standards. Therefore, there's a selling price. It was so simple. Well, not, you know, that's just not the way we do pricing these days mm -hmm. for promotions for that matter. So continuous learning is one criteria for, you know, being a CEO now. What else do you think is required now that perhaps wasn't necessary before? I be think a, um, an understanding of the technology and the desire to be close to what technology can bring your business and therefore your people in terms of productivity, but also quality of insights, quality of information to help the decision making. I think that's really important. Um, uh, I think the other thing is an, you know, a desire to look around and I'm going to say look at the world, not just the UK or America or Europe. You know, there is so much innovation anywhere in the world. I think any leader, I'm not even saying even a CEO, but any leader needs to have a, I call it a curious mind, mm -hmm. you know, and have that, uh, yeah, true desire 
to look around and listen and observe and learn because you can learn from so many different uh, you know, aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I think is also very important because whatever solutions or way of doing that you had that worked for you even two or three years ago, there is absolutely no guarantee that that's going to work for you now. Mm. You know, the pace of change, the way consumers are evolving, and the way your competition is growing and, uh, and improving uh, means you have to uh, yeah, reassess all the time. Mm -hmm. And that kind of you know, intellectual gymnastic, you have to train for it. It's a new sport. Mm -hmm. How do you train for it? I read, <laughs> I listen, I talk. Look, I'm very fortunate because I adore retail, although I do a little bit of hospitality as well. But for me, they're very similar sectors uh, because it's about serving the customer. And I've always had that passion since, you know, a little girl when I was working in my mother's shop. And uh, I look to learn. I mean, you know, my, uh, my little motto is uh, every day, what have I learned today? And what contribution have I made today? You know, in fact, I can answer those two questions when I go to bed at night, I've had a good day. Mm. So, and, you know, and sometimes you learn very small things, but, you know, it adds up. And it forces your mind to remain alert, open, so, yeah, mm. live and learn, I think, is the phrase. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, one of the top three qualities that I think is essential in a leader is that continuous learning. So I talk about it all the time. And the other two being self-awareness and the other one is social intelligence. So, you know, a, being able to understand yourself and then to be able to understand others and then to continuously learn. So I think those are really, really essential. Well, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, as a leader, and it's not just CEO roles, of course, there are many leaders in the world, you know, it's all about how to inspire others. Mm -hmm. And that's what a leader does. So that's why you have to be able to connect, to listen, to hear, to hear what is not being said um, and provide, yes. the. Uh, that's an interesting that concept of listening to what is not being said. How do you pick up on that? Or can you give an example of when that happened? Well, I think the... Uh, the, the, the usual statement is that uh, words are only 30% of any message. <clears throat> so body language is a factor. Um, so I certainly, that's what you know, I've, I've been looking at you <laughs> since a bit, but not looking just to look. I'm trying to pick up, you know, what, how you react and what you say. And, uh, and that I think is as important, if not more important than the words. It's also understanding what makes people tick. You know, everyone has got uh, different motivational uh, factors. Uh, so, you know, when you work with a team, it's about understanding what they need as a group, but also individually. And I always think that if you're a leader of a team, it's your job to adapt your style, what you say, how you say it, when you say it, and not just in words, but in action, in behavior, mm -hmm. that actually uh, meet the needs of the individuals and the team that, uh, that you're working with. Mm -hmm. So as a leader, you do mostly listening, is what I always say when people ask me, and I always say 70% of your job is to listen. It's so critical to do that, and yet, well, and yet, the best leaders do that, and the best leaders talk the talk, and they also walk the talk. So if you are not aware of what's going on, if you are talking over people, you're not hearing the reality you're just still relying all on yourself and not letting the team really bring you the information because you can't do it all on your own. You have to bring the team in together. So, yeah, no one. Yeah, and some people, you know, are more able to say how they feel than others. I mean, you know, everyone is on a different journey. So it's also your role, if you happen to be the leader of that team, mm -hmm. to help others say what they want to say. And by the way, you don't have to be the leader of the team to do that either. You know, everyone in the team can uh, or should, in my opinion, help the rest of the team, you know, come out. So, because, uh, you know, it's, you can try to read what is not said, but of course, you know, it's much easier if people express how they feel. Mm -hmm. So what you can pick up is that they're very quiet or they're not truly saying what they mean or they're not saying everything that is there. So, you know, tell me more. Or sometimes you go back, you know, then on a one-to-one -one and say, oh, you know, I got a sense that X, Y, Z, you know, do you want to talk about it? Do you have more to say? I mean, you know, 
nothing rocket science, but it's just having that desire to listen and actually be generally interested in what the other person uh, wants or needs. You've had many non-executive director positions. What have you learned about yourself during these roles? That, <laughs> it's funny because we're just talking about listening, that the ability to listen is uh, probably the most important uh, aspect in those roles mm -hmm. because by definition, as the name suggests, you are a non-executive, so you don't do anything yourself. So your role is all about influencing others, which at, you know, as a CEO is kind of what you do, but you still have through your role and your accountability, you know, a degree of, uh, call it authority, I can't choose a, a better word. You don't really have authority as a non-exec. So it's about building the relationships, building the understanding, demonstrating over time that actually you can add value to the conversation and above all, creating that uh, environment of trust so that the executive and the other non-executive really want to talk to each other, want to listen to each other, and want to solve problems together. Uh, you know, having been a CEO for nearly 25 years, I have had my fair share of boards. So I know what I liked and didn't like <laughs> as a CEO with a board. So I try to be the best of what I have learned over the years. And, uh, you know, when people ask me, well, how do you carry out that role? I usually say, I'm like your, your big sister. You know, I'm kind of there to help you. And really, you can talk to me about anything, small, large, whatever. And you don't have to please me. That's not what the role is about. I'm really here as a sounding board. Um, and the fact that you have the freedom to provide support, advice, challenge, whatever, without being attached to the results because you're not the executive and really understanding that you respect the decision that the executive team makes is also very refreshing and very liberating. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I love working as a non-exec. I mean, you know, over the last six, seven years, I have worked with some fantastic teams, very different individuals, very different types of problems, type and size of companies. But uh, that's the joy of that role. You know, the variety is even greater than the variety I had when I was in an exec role myself. Mm -hmm. So that keeps me alert for sure. Do you miss being in an executive role? Not now. Um, you know, having been an exec for so long, you kind of, you know, there was a transition period, you know, where I was missing not seeing the numbers every day or every hour and, you know, things like that. And now if I have to wait the end of the month to know the number, but, you know, you learn, <laughs> you learn, you learn. And you learn to know how the business is doing in a different way to just reading the numbers also. And that's also really good. Uh, and I think I'm even more of a person a people person now as a non-exec because my work really is through working with the CEOs that I work with or, you know, their wider team uh, from time to time mm -hmm. uh, and then the wider board, of course, also from time to time. But that relationship with a CEO is wonderful, you know, I and I'm very fortunate, you know, I, I have a portfolio of, uh, of five uh, companies at the moment and I adore all of them. It's just great. I'm curious about that moment in time when you go from an executive role to either, you know, deciding that this is it, that part is over, and then I'm going to go and, you know, go for the non-executive roles. Talk me about that period of time. Was it a decision for you to, to step away from it? And or was it a smoother transition and you kind of, yeah, talk to me about yeah, that. Yeah, it was not an overnight thing and a black and white decision. In fact, it didn't happen like that. So I was a CEO at Claire's and already for a few years, I really had a desire to be a non-exec as well as a CEO because I wanted to have access really to a different world <laughs> to help me in my own thinking and learning and development, which I thought in turn would make me a better CEO. Working with private equity, sometimes that's difficult. You know, they want a pound of flesh mm -hmm. and some actually don't allow you to have a non-exec portfolio alongside your NED role. So when I decided that I was going to leave Claire's 
uh, I started to look for NED roles because I wanted to have those already back so that if I took another CEO role, then I could negotiate as part of my new CEO contract. Well, I've already got one or two non-exec roles and I'm not letting those go, was the plan. Um, just by the way, I, I resigned from Claire's. Uh, both my parents had become ill at the same time in France. We're in the same hospital, but not on the same floor. Mm. And I was commuting for about six months between uh, Chicago and Paris every weekend to be with them, yeah. leaving my little boy behind with the nannies at the weekend. I mean, it was not sustainable. So it was a question of, you know, waiting for the school year to finish and then uh, and then come back to be closer. Um, so I had, during that time, being in a number of conversations for non-exec role, I had agreed to join the board of Superdry, which was my first appointment as a, as a non-exec. So when I left Claire's and came back to Europe to be, you know, close to my family uh, and support my parents while they were ill, um, I um, I decided that I would do more non-exec, so that gave me the flexibility to be there for my parents. And then in the event, my dad died, uh, but I was glad that you know I had a few months then to be able to be with him. My mother recovered, which was even better. Um, and that point, you know, my desire for the challenge of the CEO role really diminished very quickly. For the first time in my life, I realized really the importance of investing quality time with the family. And I realized that really, you know, I had not been there for my family ever. Um, and I decided at that point, I was going to make um, more of a balanced choice in the way I, I run my career going forward. So the non-exec role felt better. Mm -hmm. uh, also, my son, who was seven at the time, starting to have uh, anxiety attacks. Um, and uh, I needed to be a mom. So it was also important that I had more time mm -hmm. to be at home. And therefore, in a way, you know, life made it very clear to me that I could not be a CEO anymore or not at the level I had been before. Where you know I was working fourteen, fifteen hours every single day, every weekend, you know, on holiday, what holiday, you know, work would always continue, and I had to really make a different choice. So that's really how it kind of happened, uh, slowly but surely, and then I got <laughs> one private equity actually that I still work with now had a problem with one of their uh, investment and really wanted uh, me to come and. Uh, you know, as a CEO to help them fix the business so we could sell it. Um, so I tipped back as a CEO role. I agreed to do no more than two years to help them do that. I didn't do it full time because I wanted to maintain the other NED roles that I had, you know, started to secure. Uh, and then in fact, 15 months later, you know, we, we sold the business successfully and uh, we all moved on. And then I reverted to <laughs> do that. And then you mentioned Pinky, Pinky earlier on. Again, Pinky, um, I was on the board of Pinky, which was one of the companies I was on the board on. We had a few issues with the, the CEO. The business was not doing very well. And as a board, we decided that, you know, we had to let go of the CEO and appoint someone else. But at that point, we didn't have anyone else. And the company was in some difficulties. So I volunteered to my board, to my chair. I said, you know, if it were helpful, I'll step down, you know, as an interim CEO. I say up to one year, no more, just to help us, you know, find the right uh, CEO. But at least, you know, I'll do the best I can to steady, uh, steady the ship. Uh, so once again, <laughs> I went back as a CEO role. But after that, the desire to be uh, in the thick of it, as it were, had gone because by then I had developed a nice uh, NED uh, portfolio. Mm. and was really getting my uh, intellectual satisfaction from it. Do you feel like you have sacrificed your personal life to be a CEO? It's a big word. <laughs> Certainly, uh, I made some trade-offs, which is why, you know, I mean, uh, I'm a single mom. You know, I brought up my son uh, all on my own. And yes, the first seven years of his life, he was really uh, looked after by uh, nannies rather than by his mother. Um, How do you feel about that? Well, 
you know, I'm a business person. I make decisions every single day of my life. There are consequences to any decision you make. You just have to take those into account when you make your choices and then you go up and you live up to the choices you've made. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, I guess the way I'm going to answer is I don't think I would have made a different choice if I had, uh, you know, my life again. But there were consequences for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm a lot more aware of uh, putting my family first. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, when we came back to the UK, uh, in 2016, you know, my promise to my son is that I would be home more, I would not miss any school event, and then we would buy a house that would be our forever home. Because by the time he was uh, 10, he had been in nine different schools in three different countries, uh, and up to that point, uh, I had moved house on average every two and a half years. Wow. So I had no how to move. <laughs> and, you know, it was, it was taking a toll. So that was my commitment to him. And uh, I don't break my promises to my son or my business partners. And uh, I'm keeping true to my word. If you were to give advice to your younger self, if any, what would that be? It's going to sound odd what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say plan for the long term more than I did. And it's quite funny because I am a planner. I mean, even to this day, I have a three-year plan, financial three-year plan for my own life, okay? Well, in the old days, I used to do five years, but I find this these days it's more difficult mm. <laughs> to think ahead five years. But, you know, I, I run a three-year plan. I have my budget. I revisit my strategy, you know, regularly. So I do plan, but at the same time, I'm very, uh, I always have made short-term choices. You know, I'm not afraid of changing direction. Uh, and if I make a choice and then I find, you know what, that's not the right choice. Okay, well, stop. I always say, you know, if it works, do more of it. If it doesn't work, stop. And I apply that philosophy to my own life. So although I do plan, I do a lot of short-term uh, decision, which might be at odd with the long-term plan. So if I had my time again, I think I would probably, and that's, I guess that's where maturity comes into it, I would probably evaluate my short-term decision-making in more in the context of the bigger plan. So what goes into the plan? All the sources of income. Mm -hmm. All the expenses, <laughs> literally, like you would have in a business. Mm -hmm. I do my own cash flow forecast. I do my own balance sheet. So, yeah. How, so when do you do that? Or do, what's your process of creating that? Because I find this fascinating, honestly. <laughs> because I think a lot of the times we like always think of ourselves as a business. And even if you're a CEO and create that kind of business plan for yourself. So I'm just very curious. I mean, it's uh, as simple as it gets. It's an Excel spreadsheet mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's got a lot of rules about income and about expenses. Mm -hmm. And it, I do it by months, uh, three years out, and I revisit it uh, yeah, from time to time. And depending on how tight cash might be, I revisit more often than when you know cash is, uh, is more readily available. Mm -hmm. And you make big, you know, and you make your choices. But you know, you do miss, you have blind spots in business and in your personal life. You know, I know people were very critical of no one really planning for a pandemic, which I understand was actually the number one risk on the government's risk register. But as a business, we not, I mean, I've never been a business where we had planned for a pandemic. You know, closing your stores down mm -hmm. for let a month, let alone nearly two years on and off. Uh, and I made the same mistakes in my all of my plans. I never thought I would get divorced which I guess is absolutely stupid, right? Because uh, well, I a lot of you get plan it, do you? <laughs> so I never planned for that. Mm -hmm. And that, that was my, uh, my black swan that had a big impact, certainly on all my financial planning. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, you do miss <laughs> <laughs> a few things. But you see, but when you have you know, the awareness and you have your, for me, numbers, you know, I, I, I like to translate everything into numbers. I find it easier than to, uh, 
to plan <laughs> and to look ahead. It gives me a peace. With regards to like anything that you plan, like holidays, buying a home, um, we, everything is based on your numbers, your forecast. I just find that really, really interesting. What else do you consider? Like what? Oh, everything. Yeah. Is that even down to the, the dental budget? There is a, a kennel budget for the dog <laughs> because if I go traveling, of course, the dog has got to go in a kennel. So it's uh, indeed very, yeah, very detailed. But it's been very useful, for instance, whether if I'm talking to my financial advisor, you know, any question he asks, I have the answer. And he knows I have my balance sheet. I can give him my, ba my personal <laughs> balance sheet. He knows what to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, or indeed when I got divorced, you know, because you have to do all these uh, statement of affairs and everything else. Well, everything existed already. It was not uh, very complicated. And it also means that, you know, should anything happen to me ever, because, you know, I've done so much traveling, you know, I'm aware of the risks. Mm -hmm. So everything is... Uh, organized and clear should anything happen to me so that uh, you know what needs to be done to look after my son is all planned too mm. and people are not going to ruffle through you know reams and reams of paper to find out where's that what she got what does she want or whatever mm. you know i remember years ago when my father-in-law died you know his wife had no idea about anything mm -hmm. in terms of you know the finances for the family and it ended up being me who had to go through all the papers that he had in his office to try to work out what was what. Do you think you were unusual in this? Because I have a friend who passed away who was very successful, at least that's what we thought, and left absolutely no paper trail, nothing for his kids to figure out what to do. And this was, you know, a businessman who was exceptionally good with numbers but prepared nothing, even knowing that he was unwell. And I know, I mean, I've, I've lost both my mom and my stepfather and being kind of the elders, having to deal with some of the practicalities of that. It's, it's hard. It's really hard. So I know firsthand how difficult it is, um, but not everyone prepares it to that extent. Do you think you're unique in that? Or do you think... I hope maybe, that you're unique. <laughs> well, or do you think you're more concerned about that or you think about it more because you are a mother? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Um, what I do know is I know how difficult it is, like you've just described the experience you've had and if I can help. You know, there are so many traumas when you've lost, you know, a cherished one, that the last thing you also want to have to worry is all the practical thing. So actually on my desk, you know, I've got a very long desk, it's three meter wide. Uh, I have a specific envelope there with everything you need to know if I'm not there. And my son knows where it is. He can't look at it now because there are passwords, etc. I don't want him or anyone to have, mm -hmm. but it is there. And that, you know, when anything changes, I update that file. So it's, yeah, it's all there, including a list of contact of all the people, you know, where, you know, where my power attorneys are and who my account is, who's my lawyer and, you know, who's my A team. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that there are no surprises, you know, copy of the will, copy of all the power of attorneys, all this kind of thing. It's not that complicated to put together. Mm -hmm. And once it's there to update it, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's being a mother or not, but I would certainly hope <laughs> more people did it. Mm -hmm. And I know when my mother passes away, it's going to be a nightmare because there are many people she doesn't want to talk about what happens if. So my brother and I have no idea about her situation. Mm -hmm. So we will have to uh, find out. Where do you think this pragmatic approach, almost like, how do I explain this? I think... Generally, a lot of people don't want to even think about, you know, things like death or challenges or difficult things. And quite often we just sort of shut down and don't even like want to not only think about it, but definitely not to plan for that. And you come across as a person who is just so pragmatic, so organized, obviously very financially literate. I mean, having ran some of the biggest retailers in the world, but also applying that to your own life 
Like, where is this sort of pragmatism come from for you? Actually, I think for my parents, because, you know, my dad, as an engineer and a researcher, was very <laughs> organized. Um, and I remember, I mean, you know, my parents, you know, were not wealthy and, uh, you know, achieve a lot, I would, I would say. Uh, by being really careful and making, you know, sound judgment, sound investment. And I still remember when I was a little girl, you know, my mother had this little book and she would write in that little book every entry and every expense. So she knew exactly where she was. And I remember when we came to the end of the month, you know, that's where we would eat pasta and omelettes because, you know, there was no much more money and we were not going to spend over the budget. So, you know, I remember that we would go on holiday. No, we could not have an ice cream or buy a little souvenir or anything because that was not in the budget. So I, I was brought up that way and that stayed with me. In fact, you know, as a student, I had such a little book myself. And it was funny because we were talking about that with my son only yesterday. Because, you know, we started to prepare for university because he'd be there in 18 months time. And I was reminding him that uh, when I was a student, my mother would pay the rent. I had a room on campus. And uh, then I had uh, what was the equivalent of 30 pounds a month for all my outgoings, which was not enough for, you know, what I wanted to do with my life when I was a student. So I, therefore, I needed more income. So I used to teach English and German, because at the time I, I spoke German as well, uh, to young children. And I was saying to myself, I used to be paid five pounds per hour to teach children English uh, and or German. Um, and I used to more than double my budget that way. So then, you know, with kind of, you know, 100, uh, 100 pounds uh, then, <laughs> 40 years ago, I had plenty to do what I wanted to do. And in fact, I was in England every other weekend you know, <laughs> because I already had the love for England then. Mm -hmm. I was studying in Reims uh, in, in France. So, um, so that's always been like that. And until recently, I still had my very first lit such little book and it was so funny to go back to see that, you know, I would fill up my car with 15 French francs. <laughs> well, these days I don't go. <laughs> yeah. So, in fact, I remember my very first salary here at Marks and Spencer in 1982 was 6,000 pounds a year. <laughs> you know, we forget how things have changed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And we say inflation is a new thing. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. It's been happening a long time. Would you describe yourself as successful? You know, I'm, you're not the first person to ask me that question and I still don't have an answer <laughs> for it because people like to call me, oh, you're successful, tell me more about that. And I don't feel that way, I guess is the uh, honest answer. Um, and that's because I do not measure success through material facts. And yes, you know, I've earned a lot of money over my career. I have also spent a lot of money and I'm not even mentioning my divorce. <laughs> but you know, I used to have two living nannies in my house, always, so that I could have the career I had. So that costs a lot of money alone. Um, I've often lived abroad, in fact, pretty much. Uh, in fact, I've lived abroad more than I have lived in France. So, you know, to visit my, my, my family was always expensive because you had to go back to France to see everybody. So, but I'm not, I'm not complaining. And these are just choices I made. So, you know, people, okay, I might be successful if you look at it, you know, according to certain rules, like the rules I've done or the companies I've run, the size of the company or whatever, all the results we might have had in certain turnarounds. But on a personal level, which is kind of the way I would define uh, success. Like for many other people, my life has been uh, full of trade-offs. And before success, of course, there's failure. Because my favorite definition of success is just uh, the ability to get up one more time. If you have to get up, it's just because you failed before, right? And uh, I've had, I would say, many, many failures. You know, I mentioned earlier on that uh, in my executive career, I worked for about 19, I did about 19 different roles. Um, I change role on average every 18 months. I change home on average every two and a half years. 
If my grandmother, even when I was young, used to complain, she had to have one address book just for me <laughs> because I was moving so much. You know, she, she could not keep up. Mm-hmm. Benefit of a mobile phone. Now you can move and keep the same phone number. Mm-hmm. Of course, that was not the case in the old days. So, um, you know, and the aggravation every time that you move. It's, you know, a new doctor, a new dentist, new neighbors, new home, new utility provider, uh, New, 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 new hairdresser, whatever it is, you know. So there is a, a baggage that comes with moving every time. And although I always have the joy of the new, because I love the unknown, there is also the weight of making it happen. And uh, that takes its toll. So, in fact, you know, I've got an ulcer <laughs> in my stomach through stress. Mm. You know, it has not been easy. But um, again, it is not a complaint. They're just choices I have made. And I was totally uh, conscious of the choices I've made. And uh, if I had the same life again, I would do the same, I think. So I'm happy with the life I've had. And I guess that's why I would say I feel successful. And I don't use that word to myself. I just say I'm content. You know, I feel good about the life I have. I feel good about what I have achieved and I feel good about what I think I can still achieve. You know, I'm healthy, I'm uh, I'm fit, although of course one always wants less kilograms, but uh, you know, uh, I'm a happy mother, I have a wonderful relationship with my son, I have a wonderful relationship with my parents uh, or my mother uh, and my brother. Um, I've got a great partner. Yeah, life is good. Talking about failure and and the definition of success is being able to just get up again. What keeps you going? What gets you to get back up again? I think it's that strong achievement drive that we talked about earlier. You know, I uh, I so need to achieve, to deliver. And I think that comes back from my years as a sports person, you know, where when you love sports, I mean, for me, it's because I enjoy, you know, the coaching, the training, the competition, and the winning. Uh, and if I mentioned I played basketball when I was in France, when I moved to the UK, which was in 1980, as a woman, you could not play basketball in this country. And I remember going to clubs in London and I said, well, no, you know, we do netball here. I said, netball? What's that? <laughs> so we tried netball, but I didn't like the pace. It was not my sport. And, I'm uh, with you on that. I was the captain of a basketball team <laughs> and I could not understand that ball at all. And it was funny and I was fortunate enough that uh, I found a, 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 a man's team, a male team in uh, near Waterloo at the time who uh, invited me to join them so I could train with them, so I could play basketball, which was great. But of course, I could not join in any of the matches. So after a while, which was not very long, like a year or so, the joy of the sport, I lost because the competition was not there. Mm -hmm. You know, horse riding was just the same. You know, when I was in France, I had my own horses, which I used to compete with. When I moved to the UK, I was still riding, but I was not competing. Also, you know, life and work and all of that, you know. And um, again, after a while, okay, still now, I, I might ride from time to time for fun or because, you know, my son, you know, wants to have a go. But it's not the same joy because the competition is not part of the equation. I need that bit. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the spice. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's what makes it exciting and, and yeah. well, interesting. And you don't always win, of course. But that's why you want even to try again. What's the answer? To do better yeah, last time. You know, learn mm-hmm. from whatever you haven't done well. Maybe your prep was not good enough. Mm-hmm. Whether it was you, your horse, or whatever. But, you know, you... Um, you know, you learn and then you pick yourself up and you try again. And I think that has carried me through all the way. And I think this is what has helped me achieve or overcome, you know, whatever challenges I've had, whether it was at home or at work. Mm-hmm. Bringing back to that study that I mentioned in the beginning, one of the other findings was that majority of the male CEOs, apart from two, were captains of some sort of a sports team. And I think what the researcher was talking about was this early exposure to leadership made a difference in terms of their career trajectory. So I guess that's another potentially similarity of of, of 
of being in the thick of it, of that com competitiveness and winning and uh, being exposed to it early on that perhaps most women don't or parents, if they want their kids to, you know, take up more senior leadership positions or to at least provide them the grounding for it to expose girls to more sports and, you know, to follow their passions when it comes to that too. I just thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I think it's a great tool, if I can mm -hmm. call it like that, to help the person develop, you know. And <clears throat> my son is not a big lover of sports, uh, except skiing and swimming. But any other sport, forget it. So, you know, for instance, I make sure <laughs> we go skiing every year as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Because at least, you know, he will have some of the joy. And it's quite funny to see him develop and wanting to achieve more. I need to do that black run again. That was not going to, I can do it faster or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. You know, like this year he's decided now he's going to, you know, take power of the snow head on. And he's already decided, because we, we go actually in a couple of days time. And he's already decided which kids he's going to hire this year because he wants to do X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. And I love when I hear this conversation because I can see that inner strength, you know, starting to develop through sport. And that, you know, in our case, that's not a team sport there. I think team sport would be better still. But, you know, you, you, you kind of build that desire and you work on yourself because you set you know, those objectives and you want to achieve. Mm. And I think that's good prep for the, uh, for the life ahead. Definitely. I think it's being able to pick yourself up from doing hard things and not expecting life to be easy. I think if we do, then you don't build up that strength, that resilience. Like you need to be able to get back up and to try again and to try to do it better. And for me, like instilling that into my kids, that's really important because, you know, all the stories that I hear, it's, you know, it's overcoming the challenges at a very early age that set you on that path because you just build tolerance for doing hard things that you don't um you're not afraid of that yeah and you mentioned resilience which is clearly a, a key uh, characteristic and i remember during the pandemic you know that became the buzzword you know yeah businesses were resilient um i just want to come back on it because often what i have observed mm. is that people like you said life is hard life does not need to be hard i think unfortunately Often, when we are younger, we are trained to take obstacles head on. Um, this is not the way, in my opinion, life or nature works. You know, and often I use the analogy of a river. The river does get to the sea. Okay, not all. But usually that's kind of their course. But it is never a straight line from source to, you know, the end point. No river is straight all the way. And that's because the river knows that you go around obstacle, not straight on. And I think life is just the same. And if people um, made the choices to go around the obstacle rather than really try to overcome straight on, actually you can go on for longer. And in my opinion, you go further because you deploy less resources. Yes, it might take longer, but then as you make a choice, what's more important to get there? I'll say whole, <laughs> <laughs> or super stressed, super unhealthy, whatever, because it's been obstacle on those. You might still get to the end point, you might get there quicker, but in what shape? Mm. So I, I like the idea of you go with the flow. And you know, life I think is brilliant. When you learn to listen, and I mean, mm to yourself, <laughs> to other people, to life generally, uh, there is always a path of least resistance. And my uh, suggestion is always that's the path you should take. Wow. I Thank really you, uh, needed to hear that. That's an amazing analogy. It's giving me goosebumps, honestly, just thinking about that because I feel like I'm kind of like head on. I will like go through brick walls sometimes and takes its toll. And if I may, and I'm not really a gender type person in my commentary because, yeah, I don't like uh, that definition personally, but I, uh, I think women 
naturally because of the way we brought up. We have to achieve. Like to take things straight on. Which is quite funny because I think naturally, if that we if we listen to our intuition, that's not the way we would behave. Mm-hmm. But I think usually, you know, we have that sixth sense that is actually would allow you to take these detours. But we, I don't know how, but somehow, you know, we believe that uh, to succeed in the man's world, mm-hmm. <laughs> we have to fight head on. But I, uh, I don't think that's the right route. Mm-hmm. And I think most successful people don't behave that way. So do you think you've always been like that, that you go with the flow and you go with the path of least resistance? Or is it something that you've learned along the way? Well, you know, I've used sport a lot as an analogy. In my life, horse riding was my main lessons because, um, you know, you learn very early on when you ride a horse that uh, is always stronger than you. So how are you going to get to what you want to do with that horse, knowing that he will always be stronger? So as I say, that's how I think you learn to influence, to listen, to hear, in that case, you know, what the horse wants to do, doesn't want to do, cajole. And indeed, sometimes you can't get the path that you want to get that quicker path because the horse is not going to go that way. Um, I mean, I used to train horses as well, you know, in my past. And um, I get, I mean, I get animals and I get that, that helps me, uh, you know, I rescue dogs now mm-hmm. because again, I, I kind of listen to what they need to help them, you know, trust people again. Um, and I guess I'm taking that into my dealing with people because, you know, we all beings at the end of the day and we share a lot more than we uh, really think how do you figure out what the path of least resistance is like how do you spot it when you're trying to go through the wall as opposed to around it well um depending on where you are in your own journey about knowing yourself intuition is always a very good guide uh and sometimes you know you need practice because, you know, you might not know the difference between ego and intuition, but really what your gut feel is saying, your sense, you know, inside of you, not the brain, but deep here, how does it feel? And if it feels right, there's a chance it's the right way. And you know what? If you make a choice and you go down the path and it's not working out, so what? You know that was not the right path. Stop and change course so um yeah and in time i think when you're more attuned to your own intuition i think you you find the right path quicker but don't be afraid of failing i guess that's the thing you know mm-hmm. yeah don't be afraid if it doesn't work fine it doesn't work change course so what you know that doesn't work <laughs> you're not going to do it again you know learn from that and then take it with you for your next uh, choice What's the best piece of business advice you've been given? <laughs> it's funny. I had something that just came into my head when you when you said that. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure that was the best piece of advice. But anyway, for some reason, that the one that came into mind. So I will share, share it. And in fact, it was from my days when I was working at Marks Spencer. One of my uh, bosses when I was in menswear I was a gentleman called uh, Lord uh, Andrew Stone. And uh, there were a group of us one evening in the, in the buying department just chatting as we often did. And um, at one point he said uh, to us as a group, he said, you know, whatever you do in life, never make an enemy of anyone. And I'm not saying why I'm sharing that bit, but that was really an important thing to me. Not that you choose to make enemies, enemies, but sometimes you might invest more time or more care with one person rather than another. Yeah, uh, on a chemistry level, right? Yeah, there are people that we warm to straight away, and then others we do not. And when you're younger, I think you kind of dismiss the people that you naturally are not warm to. And you concentrate on the people that you are attracted to, right? And I think what I have learned, and maybe that phrase is the trigger point for me, 
uh, what I have learned is that actually there is tremendous value in all relationships and your first judgment actually can be wrong. So make the effort to go past that first impression and really learn. In fact, make more effort to learn about the person that initially you, you, you were not attracted to. Uh, and in my life, I have learned that some of my, yeah, my best friends now be in business or in part of are people that at first we just, you know, we didn't really care for each other at first. Can it go so. too far? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> if you look at the world today, I don't think we go far enough mm -hmm. to understand, you know, all the people that live on this planet. Mm. I think there would be a lot less conflict if we all made the effort <laughs> mm. to go deeper and learn each other. Learn about each other, for mm. sure. Mm. No. <laughs> Beatrice, you are just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and you've made me think about my own life and about how I behave. And I really thank you for today because it's made me think about some of the things for myself in a different way and that's been so helpful and I really appreciate that so thank you so much for coming on the show oh but thank you Marie I really enjoyed it thank you so much thank you you've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast I'm your host Maria Vorostovsky if you haven't already please follow and subscribe this podcast and I'll see you in the next episode <laughs>